Hello, this is Diane Lee again, president of the Texas Blue Bonnet Chapter of Scleroderma Foundation. And Dr. Mays is our keynote speaker today. So Dr. Mays recently received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Scleroderma Foundation. Lifetime Achievement Award is really reserved for individuals that to the in the Scleroderma Foundation for at least a decade across its entire scope of mission. As a matter of fact, Dr. May started back in 1990, but she has been involved from the very, very beginning. She's also received other awards from the Scleroderma Foundation, the Messenger of Hope Award, and the Scleroderma Foundation's Medical and Scientific Advisory Board over the past 22 years. Um, we'll get started. Hi, Dr. Mays. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off and let you get started. So thanks very much. Uh, can you see my screen? We can see your screen. We're seeing scleroderma current and future therapy, clinical oh. trials update. And we see right. you at the top of the screen also. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, thank you uh, for inviting me to do this. And I want to thank Diane Lee and other members of the Texas Blue Bonnet chapter for organizing this wonderful day. It's always a, a pleasure to participate, even getting up on a Saturday morning, but I'm, I'm so pleased that so many other people have decided to do the same. Uh, I'm in my office. If you can see the background, I sort of tidied it up uh, from my usual pile of papers here and there, but let's get started. I don't have a full hour talk. I've uh, allowed time at the end of the talk to answer questions because that's what I find in giving these uh, talks that the most interesting thing for me and for many of the attendees is the question and answer session. So this talk, I think, is a, is a very optimistic one. I didn't realize I'd been on the medical and scientific board for 22 years. It seems like only yesterday. But anyway, let's talk about current and future therapy. Now these I'm going to be talking about clinical trials research, not about the lab research that we also do, but the kind of research that has a direct impact on how patients are treated, not just today, but also in the near future, what's coming down the pike. So clinical trials updates. Uh, first of all, a little bit of background. Let's talk about the phases of a clinical trial. Uh, so here are the phases. Phase one, uh, phase one. Uh, these, this is an early phase of the trial. You determine what dose is safe, how treatment should be given, if it should be one milligram a day or an IV infusion every two or three weeks or by injection or whether it's a pill. Now phase two looks at is this effective? Uh, now that we have an idea that it is safe, we're really looking for side effects and a, and a signal of effectiveness. And then finally, the phase three trials. Now we are all experts on uh, phase three trials because of the vaccine trials. We'll talk about that as an example of uh, clinical trials in a few minutes. But in the phase three, three trial. This is really the big trial that determines whether the new treatment is effective and whether it's better than what's out there, whether it's a better alternative to the current standard of care. And then phase four trials are post-marketing. This is after the FDA has approved the medication and you're trying to see if there is some signal of side effects that maybe weren't determined in the phase three section of the trial. So uh, this was as of 2015, but actually I don't think it's really changed much. And this is looking at drug company trials, pharma industry. You start out with uh, drug discovery. This is the preclinical. This is um, looking at the medication, a new drug in uh, in mice or in the test tube, and you think out of, these are now tens of thousands of potential medications. Some of them make it into the mice, and then if you look at clinical trials, 
is the phase one trials and usually tens of patients, uh, maybe 20, 30, or 40 patients. And of these, you don't go into the phase two, which is all monitored and regulated by the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA here in the US, and uh, similar organizations in Canada, uh, Europe, and South America. Uh, so uh, now, out of all of these, say 50,000, 100,000 potential medications, you're down to these in phase one, and out of those, only a small number of uh, uh, medications make it to phase two trials. And now you're looking at hundreds of people. And then only the ones that look safe and potentially effective go into the phase three trial. And now you're looking at thousands. So I'll ask you a question, and unfortunately, I won't be able to uh, uh, know your answer right away. Uh, but uh, if you remember the vaccine trial with Pfizer, how many people did they include in their phase three? Pause, and the answer is 40,000 people. 40, 000, or actually over 40,000 people participated in the phase three trial. And of all of that, to get one FDA approved medication. So this is uh, where we are in terms of the vaccine trials. Uh, it's an emergency authorization, not a full uh, uh, approval, but nonetheless, even after you get approval, then there is this post-marketing when it's the medication is taken by even more patients, 100,000, a million, to see if there is some signal that maybe it's not quite as safe as you thought it was. But most medications, not all, but many, many, most medications, once they get the FDA approval, then phase four does not take them off the market. So let's talk about the phase three clinical trials, which is mostly what I do, but we're also involved in a in a phase uh, one trial, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So uh, it has to be controlled. So that means that some of the people get the new medication and some get a dummy medication, a placebo. And if it is uh, a pill, then the pill is uh, manufactured to look exactly the same as the new medication, the same color, the same size. Uh, everything looks about the same. And, and it must be randomized so that if you are participating, whether or not you get the study medication or the dummy placebo medication is determined by chance, like the flip of a coin. And this is usually computer generated. So I can't decide which one you're going to get. You can't decide which one you're going to get. And double blind. Neither the participant nor the investigator knows what's being given. We only know that you've got the pill or the IV medication or whatever. We don't know if it's the real thing or not. Ah, so let's look at past scleroderma studies. So this looks at the randomized, so uh, assigned by chance, double blind, controlled, multi-center trials for scleroderma between in the 20 year period between 1995 and 2015. And for the most part, I was involved pretty much in all of these. So there was the first trial we did still, um, I think that was one of the best trials, uh, multi-center uh, trial with myself and multiple other people who have become good friends. Uh, and then there was a photophoresis trial. There was uh, an interferon alpha trial that was done in the UK, uh, a, relax, uh, a recombinant human relaxant trial, an oral collagen trial, TGF beta. Uh, there was something called BIL2. There was the lung study one using cyclophosphamide versus placebo. And this is 
many years ago in the days when we could use uh, pure placebo in scleroderma, and then lung study too. So what about the results of all of those trials? Well, penicillamine, unfortunately, well-designed, well-conducted, uh, but at the end of the day, there was no difference between people who are on the real medicine and people who are on the placebo. Uh, the photophoresis trial was negative you know, interferon, relaxin, collagen, TGF beta, build to, and finally, 20 years in the making, but finally, finally, we had a positive trial. And I think this is a real testament to the investigators who take care of scleroderma patients and who do these trials that we really knew this was important and over and over again, we participated in these trials with the hope that something would work out and we would actually get a medication that was effective. This was uh, wonderful news uh, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. Unfortunately, the drug was cyclophosphamide, which some of you may have been on in the past and we still use a little bit today, but it is a somewhat toxic drug, which led to lung study two. That was also a positive trial. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so recent positive clinical trials, lung study two, also known as SLS2. Now this was not sponsored by um, a drug company. This was sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. So it is all our tax dollars, thanks to all the U.S. Um, attendees, uh, one of the good things that we're doing with our tox dollars. So let's talk first about what is scleroderma lung disease. It's also known as interstitial lung disease or ILD. What it is, is scar tissue buildup. And this is in the lungs and it starts in the bottom of the lungs, the lung bases, and then slowly increases up the lungs. But not all patients worsen. Some people have a little bit of ILD, and five years later, it's still a little bit of ILD, and 10 years later, the same story. But the problem is for the people who do have progressive disease, it is um, a, a, a terrible complication. Uh, and how do you know it? How do you, how do you identify if people have uh, ILD since not all scleroderma patients have it? Well, pulmonary function tests. This is good because it is what we call non-invasive, doesn't involve any uh, radiation or surgical procedures. But even if you have pulmonary function tests that are not quite normal, that doesn't absolutely make the diagnosis because there is so much variation from one person to the next in terms of their lung capacity, which is what we're determining with the pulmonary function tests. And for those who have had, you know, if you've had them, you know what it is, you blow into the machine and it measures how fast you can breathe in and breathe out and what your lung volumes are. And I think there's going to be a talk on this alone a little later in the day, but you really need to confirm this by a CAT scan. Now, this is a plain x-ray of interstitial lung disease. And um, I was looking uh, yesterday all over the place in my past slides to try to find a normal lung x-ray and I couldn't do it. But anyway, uh, if you look at the dark spots up here at the top of the lungs and sort of in the mid lung bases, this is the way the entire lung should look because air, in the little air sacs in the lungs does not show up on an x-ray. What shows up is bone, and this is the heart shadow, this is the diaphragm. So you see all of this white stuff in the bottom of the lungs, this should not be there. This is collagen, this is scar tissue. This blocks off those little air sacs. So you cannot efficiently exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide. And people who have this severe lung disease are short of breath, not maybe not at rest initially, but certainly with activity because they don't have the lung capacity, the reserve capacity to increase their oxygenation with exercise. 
Now, many of you have probably had a CAT scan, and some of you may be familiar with this kind of image. So this is a slice. If we go back, this looks, you're standing in, uh, in front of the x-ray machine, and here you're lying down and they're doing cross-sectional cuts. And this is a normal chest CT. See how dark all of this is? Well, that's all the air sacs filled with air. That's good. And these white strandy things uh, are the blood vessels. So they're larger blood vessels uh, when you get close to the center of the chest. And then they branch out nicely. And this is where all of the oxygen uh, to carbon dioxide exchange takes place. Uh, the other little white spots are just seeing a blood vessel on end. Now, uh, if I think it's going to work, we'll see what happens in somebody with scleroderma. Oh, this, and let me also orient you. This is the, the spine, the vertebral body. This is the heart. These are the lungs. So this is somebody lying on their back. Okay, and this, you can really see the difference. This is interstitial lung disease. So all of this white stuff, all of this gray, they call it ground glass. So it's kind of a grayish and here very white. This is all scar tissue. And you can see that there's only a small amount of normal uh, lung that's uh, on either side. So this is what the lung looks like. And the goal of treatment is to not get this bad, but to stop, um, well, the goal, the, the main goal would be to reverse it, which currently um, is, is, is not possible with what we have today in terms of medication, but at least to slow the progression. So if you have a little bit, this is not really a little bit of, of lung, this is normal lung, but you never go from normal to this. So let's look at scleroderma lung study two. So this was randomized, and we know what that means. Double blind, prospective, controlled trial of one year of oral cyclophosphamide, also known as cytoxin, followed by a year of placebo versus two years of daily oral mycophenolate which was also known as cell set mycophenolate is the generic name for it. So uh, it wasn't placebo. There was a placebo here, but that's only because we were looking at two years of treatment. So for the first year, people, everybody got treated either with cytoxin or with mycophenolate cell set. So nobody was on a true placebo. And let's see what happened. So the primary outcome measure was a pulmonary function test at the end of the study. So better, worse, the same. And conclusions, results, both treatment arms resulted in improvements in lung function. There was some suggestion that the CAT scan was actually a little better in terms of patient response, how people feel shortness of breath improved, and we also saw an improvement mild in skin scores. But the advantage, and I think the real take home message from SLS2 was that the treatment with mycophenolate had fewer serious side effects compared to treatment with cyclophosphamide. So it was a safer drug. It looked to be about as effective and uh, I think was a real home run. And now as a result of this study, mycophenolate is considered, quote, standard of care, close quotes, for scleroderma related lung disease. Now that said, not everybody responds to it. Uh, although mycophenolate had fewer side effects than cytoxin, still there were some side effects associated with it. And any of you who are on mycophenolate at the moment uh, know the, uh, there's, there are GI complications, some nausea, uh, decreased appetite. So it's not without potential side effects. So that leads us to uh, the next study I want to talk about. Now, uh, there are actually uh, quite a few studies that um, 
are done and have been done. I'm only going to talk about a small number because of time, but the and because I'm looking at successful trials. Uh, Nintetinib, a uh, trade name OFEV, was also looked at for scleroderma lung disease. Now, this was not NIH sponsored, this is industry sponsored, so a drug company. It was a multi center study, an international, randomized, double blind, controlled study of nintetinib versus placebo. Now, the outcome measure was pulmonary function tests. Oh, and something uh, about the controlled study for people who were on mycophenolate or methotrexate or some other medication, they could continue on that same medication. So nintetinib or placebo was added to their baseline medications. So, and the outcome measure, once again, pulmonary function tests, uh, background therapy was permitted, and usually this was mycophenolate. Some people were on methotrexate, uh, but not everyone in the study because it was a large 600 patient international study. And uh, fortunately, and I'm very happy to say that the results were positive, which is at the, at the end of the study, there was better lung function in those who were on nintetinib than those who were on placebo, even if they were on background mycophenolate or methotrexate. So uh, again, another positive study. And consequently, nintetinib be, was the first drug FDA approved for scleroderma related and other fibrotic lung diseases. Now let's talk about another medication that uh, is approved for fibrosing lung diseases. And that's a medication called perfenidone, trade name Esbrit. This again, an industry sponsored, different drug company, multi-center, international, randomized, double-blind controlled study. And the outcome measure was essentially the same, pulmonary function tests. And one thing, well, we'll talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria in, in a few minutes, but the only people who could get into either the perfenidone study or the nintetinib study are people, obviously, who had scleroderma, if you were looking at scleroderma, lung disease, uh, or um, other forms of lung disease. And you, you had to have evidence of lung disease to start with. Uh, and you couldn't have a great deal of lung disease you could have, you needed to have some, but not of such a severe extent that it would be unlikely for any medication to be helpful. And again, background therapy was permitted, usually mycophenolate and methotrexate, and the results again were positive. Better lung function in those on perfenidone than in those on placebo. And consequently, Perfenidone was also FDA approved for fibrotic lung disease. So what about combination therapy? If uh, uh, nintetinib is effective and if mycophenolate is effective and esbreed, could we add mycophenolate to esbreed? Uh, could we add, myco could we look at mycophenolate plus uh, nintetinib? Well, there is a study that's going, currently ongoing that is looking at that. This is scleroderma lung study three, which is mycophenolate alone versus mycophenolate plus perfenidone, also known as esbreed. And this is an early scleroderma related lung disease. Now, this is an NIH sponsored study. Actually, it is um, partner approach with the NIH providing some funding and the drug company that makes Esbreet also supplying the medication free of charge. Uh, ongoing study. Every People have already been recruited and this is about 120 patients, I think, uh, but we don't know the results because participants are in the treatment phase still, and this will be ongoing for at least the next year, 
and then the analysis needs to be done. And then at the end of that period of time, we'll get the results. So we're probably looking at a couple years from now. Whoops. Okay. So uh, is a clinical trial right for you? I know I'm sure people in the audience are asking about this. And these are not the only clinical trials. There are other ones that are coming up. But the answer to this question depends, first of all, are you willing? Are you willing to take the risk of placebo? And are you willing to take the risk of a new medication that has not been fully tried in scleroderma? Because that's what the, the research is doing. That's, that's what we're looking at. And the second issue is, are you eligible? As I indicated, there are inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, and those will vary from one study to the next. So let's talk about a study that is currently recruiting. This is called Bravos. Uh, it's an NIH sponsored, so it's not a drug company sponsored. It's an NIH sponsored, and this is this is not phase one half. It's phase one slash two, which is to say we are looking both at the right dose as well as potentially serious side effects. It's randomized, uh, controlled, double-blind, multi-center trial. There are, I think, eight or 10 uh, centers, including uh, here at UT Houston, that are doing the study. Uh, and it is eight infusions of either IV brintuximab versus IV placebo. So these eight infusions, each one is done over uh, or every three weeks. So the entire study is six months of treatment followed by six months of observation. And eligibility criteria. Well, before we get to that, let me tell you a little bit about what brentuximab is. The MAB means it's a monoclonal antibody. And this is very similar to monoclonal antibodies that you may be familiar with. Uh, rituximab, uh, infliximab, the rheumatoid arthritis drugs, psoriatic arthritis drugs, other drugs are monoclonal antibodies. This one targets one of the immune cells, one of the subsets of immune cells that are activated in scleroderma. Now, this activation occurs in lots of other diseases as well, and it is currently approved, brentuximab is approved to treat some forms of immune cell cancers. So it's out there and it's on the market, but it has not been previously tried in scleroderma, which is what this study is all about. Now, would you be eligible? Well, it has to be early disease within five years of onset of scleroderma. Now, onset begins not with the diagnosis because as many of you already know, the diagnosis can be delayed from the onset of symptoms for quite some time. So we set the onset of disease at the time of the first non-Raynaud's uh, symptom. So if you developed Raynaud's five years ago and um, were okay for a year or so, and then noticed that your hands were puffy, you couldn't wear your rings, um, things were aching, skin felt tight, Whenever that started, and it's always a little bit of an estimate, but many people know pretty closely when that started, that's the onset of disease. And you have to have diffuse skin involvement. So thick, tight skin, not just of the hands, forearms, but it has to extend to the upper arms and or to the chest or the thighs in addition to the hands. There are several other inclusion and exclusion criteria I won't go into at the moment. Uh, you don't need to have lung disease, uh, but if you do, the lung disease has to be 
uh, fairly well controlled, and you have to have moderately good lung uh, function. Ah, so that brings me to the next uh, study I want to discuss, and this is uh, a study looking at Raynaud's phenomenon. Uh, Raynaud's, which is, I know you'll recognize this photo, it's the uh, color changes of the fingers on cold exposure. Doesn't have to be all the fingers. Um, this is actually provided by a patient of mine back in 2009. Uh, and you can see purplish discoloration here, fairly normal here and here, and obviously the pallor, uh, the, uh, uh, the lo loss of blood supply. Uh, and then this is as associated with burning, tingling, numbness, not good sensation. So we have an ILAPRO study and recruitment is ending, actually it's probably going to be ending before March 15th uh, because we will have recruited most of the patients by then. Um, it's industry sponsored, again, drug company sponsored, and it is a multi-center, randomized, controlled, double-blind study. So we're, we're all familiar now with this. And it's five consecutive days of an IV medication called Ilaprost, which is a vasodilator. So it opens up the blood vessels and it's compared to five days of IV placebo. So people come into our research infusion suite Monday through Friday and the infusion lasts five to six hours. So it's really all day by the time people get here, get the IV started, et cetera. Uh, and it also requires people taking that week off from work or if they have childcare responsibilities, they have to find a way to, um, to, to accommodate that. Uh, so you have to be willing and uh, eligible and realize that there is the risk of five days of um, watching TV and reading books in our infusion suites uh, and possibly getting placebo. So uh, who is eligible? You don't need to have early scleroderma. You can have scleroderma of any disease duration, but you have to have frequent Raynaud's episodes. Usually at least a couple a day or several over a week's time. No infected digital ulcers. You can have an ulcer, but it should not be infected. And again, there are a few other inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, uh, so before I leave the ILAPRO study and these other studies, these are ongoing and we don't know the results. We don't know if they are uh, successful or not. I'm very hopeful for all of these studies. Uh, one, thing I, one thing about ILAPRO is that it is approved in Europe, IV medication or scleroderma related Raynaud's phenomenon. So I think there is very good evidence uh, that it will be effective. But like I say, that's the reason we do these studies because we don't know for sure. That's the reason we randomize them and we blind them because for all of the manifestations of scleroderma, there are some days that are good days, some days that are not so good days for patients, and we want to make sure that we have accommodated that variation by making them double blind. Ah, so what about other trials, new tr uh, scleroderma trials? Well, actually, there are quite a few of them, both phase two and phase three trials uh, being planned by drug company. Uh, or by the NIH, and they should be starting recruitment fairly soon. Eligibility criteria varies for these trials. So not all people are eligible for all trials, and some people may not be eligible for any trial. But if you are thinking that you would want to participate, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov for details. If you don't live in Houston, if it's not convenient for you to come to this center, at clinicaltrials.gov. They'll tell you where the, uh, the centers are, where you can go. And also for many of the trials, not all, but now these days for most trials, you can stay on background medication 
and you can be reimbursed for travel and for the time that you spend in the actual uh, research treatment. So um, the goal is not to pay people too much to participate in the trial. We don't want to sort of bribe people to do something they would ordinarily would not do. But we want to make sure that people are not out money because of the participation in the trial. So we're trying to make it neutral in terms of financial outlay. Ah, so uh, in terms of the current state of clinical trials, I think the future is looking quite bright for scleroderma treatment. And with that, and I know I've got about 20 minutes uh, for questions, and I've left a lot of uh, questions or a lot of time at the end because I think, I hope, uh, people have questions and put them in the chat box. Okay, well, Diane, I think we'll go back to you and your team. Hi, Dr. Mays, thank you so much. Bring our two people that are asking questions on. So Misty Chapman, is going to come on and Stacy Graff. We should start seeing their pictures soon. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn my camera off because Misty, who is, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. She's the vice president on the Texas Blue Bonnet Chapter Board of Directors. And Stacy Graff is a member of our Texas Board of Directors, just began in July. And okay, I'll ask the first question. Um, Dr. Mays, one of the questions for you was, what advice do you have for a newly diagnosed patient? Well, uh, I think it is helpful to be seen at a scleroderma center because there are uh, there are ways to evaluate the disease and to follow it. Uh, you may or may not need pulmonary function tests at, as baseline and an echocardiogram, various blood tests. Uh, it, it depends on each individual. So I can't say everybody should get pulmonary function tests. That's, that's just not right. Or everybody should get various, uh, various tests. But I think it's helpful. And I know it's difficult because there are not a lot of scleroderma centers. Uh, the Scleroderma Foundation has a list of them that includes people, really, it covers the whole country. And I know there are some in, in Canada as well. Uh, so if you can get to a scleroderma center, that would be helpful. Surprisingly, not all scleroderma patients need to be treated, and not all of them need to be treated with our um, medications like mycophenolate or methotrexate or cytoxin. The, um, so it's okay not to be on these medications. Uh, the individual rheumatologists, the private people out there, I have a great deal of respect for. They may only have a handful of scleroderma patients in their entire practice of a thousand or more rheumatology patients. And in fact, they may not only have seen a small number of scleroderma patients in their training. So it's hard for them to keep up with all of the, the latest uh, treatments and approaches. Unfortunately, the American College of Rheumatology does not have guidelines for treatment, partly because not a lot of medications are FDA approved and uh, there's a, such a great deal of variation in scleroderma, but I think we're approaching that. I think the uh, research in clinical trials and treatment is becoming mature enough and big enough that we can start to make these recommendations. Uh, there are guidelines for the treatment of lupus, guidelines for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. And I would think then certainly in the next five years, there'd be guidelines for scleroderma as well. But currently, we don't have that. Thank you, Dr. Mays. So we've had several questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. 
Um, some are wondering if they should stop their cell sept before getting the vaccine, if it's safe to get the vaccine. And one question in particular was asking if a patient with ILD is safe to get the vaccine. Okay, uh, I was anticipating this because I get this question <laughs> uh, several times a day, every day. And I know uh, people are worried about it, <laughs> worried about the vaccine, they're worried about the disease. Uh, anyway, the uh, yes, they should get the vaccine. Absolutely true, unless they've had a bad reaction to other vaccines in the past. So for the most part, probably 99% of people should get the vaccine, even with scleroderma, and actually uh, probably more so with lung disease, because that puts individuals at higher risk for uh, complications, pneumonia, hospitalization, all of that. And actually, the American College of Rheumatology, the ACR, has just earlier this week came out with uh, guidelines on what to do with our medications prior to getting the vaccine. And I was surprised uh, that mycophenolate is okay. Can keep taking the mycophenolate. Methotrexate is the only medication that they suggest that you stop. Uh, the, you don't, methotrexate is given on a weekly basis. So uh, if you, for example, usually take it on Sunday, okay to take it then, get your vaccine on Wednesday, but the next Sunday, hold that dose of methotrexate and wait till the next Sunday to resume it on your regular schedule. And that's true for both uh, shots of the vaccine, but now uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has just been given off emergency authorization by the FDA. I don't know when that vaccine will be available, Currently, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, same guidelines. Both of them are two injections, either three or four weeks apart. For uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it is only one shot. So there is an advantage to that, but the doses are not widely available now. And as we all know, the COVID vaccine doses, even, even Moderna and Pfizer are not, I mean, you can't just, go into your CVS and get, get a shot the way you can a flu shot. But if you're available, if the vaccine is available to scleroderma patients, then yes, you should get them, but just hold the mycophenolate, I mean, hold the methotrexate. You don't need to hold the mycophenolate or the hydroxychloroquine, the plaquenil, the low-dose prednisone, all of that is okay to take. Thank you. The next question is, uh, where do we find out the new medications that are better? For instance, is there a comparison list somewhere to find? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> uh, what you need, of course, is a study that is a head-to-head -head comparison of, uh, say, Esbrit, which is uh, perfenidone versus mycophenolate, and that does not exist. And unless the NIH sponsors it, it is unlikely to ever exist because they're made by two different drug companies and the drug companies are not interested. And I'm sorry if there are some representatives from drug companies on the call, but the drug companies are not interested in doing a study that could show that their drug is less effective than the other. So, uh, you know, what, what I do in my personal practice, and I think this is generally true for most uh, rheumatologists and, and people who see a lot of scleroderma patients, uh, you start with one medication and uh, see how well it's tolerated. If it doesn't cause diarrhea, some nausea, can you get around those side effects? And uh, if it's not tolerated, then you switch to something else. I didn't mention there's another form of mycophenolate, uh, brand name Myfortic, tends to be a little better on the stomach. Uh, but if those two things, those two forms of the uh, medication aren't tolerated, then you could consider going to the perfenidone, but there are some side effects with that as well. So uh, it's a matter of tolerance from a side effect point of view and a matter of effectiveness. 
Thank you. The next question is about placebos. Um, they asked, what is the point of a placebo? It has no medicinal value, so why would they think that the person taking a placebo would have any benefits? She said, I know this is to see if there's a difference from those taking the actual drug, but I feel like it is a dead end for those who actually get the placebo. Well, um, when you look at medicines, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to use the mycophenolate trial um, as, uh, as um, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, nintetinib trial as an example. Uh, nintetinib was not approved for lung disease in this country. So the only way you could get the medication was through a clinical trial. So you can stay on your mycophenolate, you can stay on background medication. So the, what, you're, what you're asking about is the advantage to the patient. The advantage is that you have usually a 50-50 chance of getting the real medication in a way that you would ordinarily not be able to get it. Now for the nintetinib trial, after the trial was over, and it was shown to be effective and safe. Then the drug company permitted people to go on it as an open label extension. So if you were on placebo, you could go on the real drug. If you had been on the real drug, you could stay on it and the company would provide it. Um, I have a few patients who are still in the open label extension now, uh, two years, a little over two years after the end of the study. So that's sort of an advantage. Um, for things like brentuximab, you, the only way you can get that if you have scleroderma is through the study. And you don't have to go off your mycophenolate or your other medications. So yes, uh, if you're on placebo, uh, you don't get a benefit from being in the study. But um, you should, in some ways, you're not penalized as well. Right, so thank I know you. There are some people who are risk takers and say, okay, I'll take a 50-50 chance. And other people who say, no, I'm gonna wait a year or two until we have the results of the trial. And that's very personal. I understand that and that's fine. Thank you. The next question is, are there any clinical trials for esophageal and gastroparesis? Oh, I was hoping nobody would ask that. <laughs> <laughs> And the answer obviously is no. Um, okay. This is a, 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 a big problem for many, if not most of our patients. And one of the problems is trying to decide if something is effective, if the drug is effective or not. Uh, it's not just a matter of symptoms of heartburn because you can take uh, an, an acid proton pump inhibitor. There are now half a dozen of them. And the heartburn to some extent will go away, but the damage to the esophagus and the damage to the stomach, that it, the, the muscle is not moving well, that is very difficult to quantify. And if you can't measure it precisely, you can't see the difference between the new medication and the other one. So, you know, I, I always wonder is, does nintetinib or perfenidone or cyclophosphamide help or slow down, help the GI tract or slow down the progression of muscle loss in the esophagus and stomach and bowel? And we don't know. Thank you. Our next question um, is, or states, would you know if any of the ongoing studies are assessing each participant's SSC intrinsic molecular subset to determine if any one of the subsets are predictors of response or resistance to the new therapy? Right. Um, yes, <laughs> those studies are ongoing. Those are companion studies. So for the clinical trials out, um, clearly the main outcome measure is either skin uh, scores or lung involvement or there's a combination score, uh, but for most of the studies now, we draw blood for research, and that's sort of stored away. We're looking at immune cells and serum, and also we do skin biopsies before and after, and that's 
those are being tested to see exactly, uh, to answer the question the, uh, that is posed, which is to say of the people who get better or the people who don't respond, can you look back at their blood and say, oh, it's because this compound was up or this uh, immune cell uh, was dysregulated and that was improved or the uh, cells in the skin of a certain type predict response. So these people should get nintedinib, these people should get esbrit, these people should get something else. Uh, but those studies are ongoing and right now we don't have a good way to predict that. There are, um, there are some studies looking at gene expression in skin that suggest that if you are of a certain type, then you're more likely to respond, but those are still preliminary studies. We don't know for sure, but I, that's clearly where uh, the, the field is going, so that not everyone needs to take the risk of a new medication. We can target it much more precisely to people who are most likely to respond. Okay, we have a few minutes left, so let's see if we can get through one or two more questions. Are you aware of any Canadian trials or where I can look for a Canadian trial? Uh, um, so I would think, I don't know for sure, but I would think that the uh, Canadian government would have a, a similar website to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, and when you go to the US site, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, and put in search for scleroderma, that's how you get the scleroderma trials. And it's reasonably user friendly. Uh, and I would think that uh, the Scleroderma Foundation of Canada would, have, would, would be a good resource to find that. Because I know a lot of these studies, as I mentioned, they're international studies. So the, the NIH sponsored ones obviously are limited to the US, but the drug company sponsored ones tend to be international. Thank you. The next question, um, they love your book and they're wondering if you have a new edition planned. Oh, I've been planning the new edition for a while, um, but I wanted to wait until you know some of the trials were done and then there are always new trials coming up, um, but yeah. That, that's on my uh, to-do list, but probably not too soon, because I think the last edition was 2005, and that is now, uh, uh, the basic part of it is still true, but a lot under treatment, uh, yeah, needs to be revised and updated. I'm glad we got to that question. I wanted to know the answer, too. Um, I think we just have a minute left. Um, is there another question we should ask or um, it's about time to move on? I'm gonna ask this one last question. Okay. Are there any scleroderma trials available for children? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, most of the trials uh, are for individuals 18 years old and above. Uh, so unfortunately, no. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mays. Um, I think we're about out of time and going on to our next speaker in about five minutes. Thank you so much. That was great. <laughs> You're certainly welcome. Take care, everybody. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mays. And thank you, too, to Stacy and Misty for following up with the questions. And that was a great session. It was a great way to start out our day. And we so appreciate it. And we are gonna take a five minute break until 10.30 and then Dr. Leslie Ann Sakaku will be speaking on befriending the scleroderma gut.